Hello, everyone. I'm Carson from the Cornell Advocacy Project, a student organization dedicated to providing an education and advocacy to anyone with an internet connection. Welcome back to Speak Now, Series 1, Dismantling Division. On today's episode, Law and Disorder, we'll be speaking with Cornell Law Professor and Top Constitutional Scholar Michael Dorff. With Professor Dorff's help and expertise, we'll explore the role that the Constitution and judicial system play in fighting, or contributing to, political polarization. Welcome, Professor Dorff. We're excited to have you with us. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here. Thank you again, Professor Dorff, for joining us today. If anyone in the audience has a question for Professor Dorff during our discussion, feel free to use the Q&A box down below. If time allows us at the end, we will certainly ask some of them. We have a slightly shorter episode today, so we're going to start by cutting right to the big picture. First, we'll explore polarization and where it comes from. So let's start simple. Uh, Professor Dorff, what is polarization to you? So polarization, uh, that is to say political polarization, can be understood in terms of a curve, let's say. So if you think of a normal distribution, a bell curve, that's not polarization. But now think about a different kind of a curve, a curve that is peaked at both ends, right? So it goes up, goes down in the middle, and goes up again, right? And let's imagine that those are numbers of people who hold views on some issue arrayed along an ideological spectrum. If public opinion is polarized in with respect to some issue, right, everybody is either very pro-gun control or very anti-gun control, that's what it's going to look like. On most issues, we expect there not to be that kind of polarization. What we expect is a kind of normal distribution, a lot of people in the middle, and there are some people at the extremes. Now, so that's what political polarization is, and you can see it in lots of different issues. Um, it's not, uh, you know, it, it's not inherently a problem, right? That is to say, there are some circumstances in which you might want polarization, right? If uh, half the country supports something truly terrible, well, you don't want the other half of the country to be very close to them, but a little bit over so that it's a normal distribution. You want the other side to be as far away as possible to combat that. But polarization is nonetheless a problem, all things being equal because it makes it hard for people to come together and find common solutions to their problems, uh, politically and otherwise. Thank you. And absolutely, that uh, sort of extremism and drifting off to the sides can sometimes come and affect our personal relationships. You know, in a 2019 study, PRRI, a nonpartisan research group, found that 35% of Republicans and 45% of Democrats no longer wanted their children marrying someone from the other political party. Do you see that as something dangerous? Uh, sure. I mean, I think that is a reflection of polarization, right? The, there was a time not all that long ago, and you still see this from some people with uh, somewhat uh, uh, odd views, where people referred to republicrats, right? They thought the two parties were very much the same. And in fact, political scientists took this view uh, in the 1950s, that the United States didn't have enough polarization. So you wouldn't see that kind of a result in a country in which views on uh, politics were very close to one another, where the difference between a Democrat or a Republican is, is almost impossible to tell. Right? There were Southern Democrats who were much more conservative than Northern Republicans, and then there were all sorts of other variations. So I think what you're seeing bleeding over into the uh, personal sphere is a reflection of the fact that Democratic and Republican parties have become not just polarized, but also a kind of social identity, right? So that uh, there is, it's, it's not just a, a set of views about policy, it's a view about lifestyle, right? So if you're thinking that um, a person who belongs to the other party is going to have all sorts of other preferences that go along with that, including other things that might be very important to you, like religiosity, um, things that, you know, like hobbies, maybe not quite as important, but important in a relationship, right? Uh, it's not surprising that you see that. And so, yes, it's troubling, but it's troubling, I think, more as a reflection of where we are than in and of itself. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, on your blog, Dorf on Law, you suggested that during the latest Trump impeachment trial, uh, polarization prevented us from holding the president accountable. Uh, what did you mean by that? Right. So this is a I'm going to give a somewhat lengthy answer to that question. Uh, let's go back to the founding of the United States. The framers of the U.S. Constitution and especially James Madison uh, really didn't like 
political parties. They didn't really know what we what we think of as modern political parties, but to the extent that they had a conception of it, Madison called them factions. And his worry was that a faction would come to control all of government, right? A, a single group, and that group would dominate, and that would leave everybody else out in the cold. And political parties were therefore a way of factions gaining control of the government, and he thought this was a very bad idea. He believed, and he laid this out in Federalist Number 10, that the size and diversity of the United States, which of course was much smaller and much less diverse now uh, then than it was than it is now, but he believed that even that amount of size and diversity would prevent uh, factions from forming at the national level because there would be so many diverse interests at the state and local level based on different economic interests, social, etc., cetera, uh, that you would have constant shifting coalitions. And as a result, people would have to compromise. As a result, he expected there wouldn't be political parties. Neither did most of the framers. Turns out they were wrong. They basically did not understand the system they had created. Uh, the system that they created required some means of coordination among people who wanted to influence government policy, and political parties quickly emerged to do that. And because from very early on and by law eventually, we have had winner-take-all elections uh, in districts, a, something called Duverger's Law, which is something in political science, leads naturally to a stable two-party system. Occasionally a third party arises, but usually it then dies. Occasionally it replaces one of the other parties. And so from the very beginning, we've had a two-party system. Uh, and this basically caused the whole system to crash in the third national election. Um, the, the first, uh, well, maybe called the fourth national election, yeah. The, the, the first two are basically acclamations for George Washington. Adams wins the, the next one. And then in the election of 1800, there's this stalemate between Jefferson and Burr, who are running essentially as a ticket, uh, that leads to the you know, multiple votes in the House of Representatives. The people at the time fix that problem with the 12th Amendment, right? So that ever since the 12th Amendment, the president and vice president run as a ticket. But they don't fix the bigger problem. And the bigger problem is that we have a system of government premised on a notion of checks and balances that assumes that institutions like the House of Representatives, the Senate, the presidency, the states, will all serve their institutional interest and doesn't take account of the fact that they'll be serving party interests. So when I say that, the, the, that polarization uh, made the uh, second Trump impeachment sort of a foregone conclusion, what I mean is that given party loyalty by enough Republicans, there wasn't going to be a chance of a successful removal. Uh, now, it's not just it's just not just the existence of parties. After all, there were Republican sufficient Republicans in uh, the, in Congress during Watergate uh, that Nixon would have been impeached and removed. Uh, but that was a time of substantially less party polarization so that Republicans could sort of cross over uh, to boot out one of their own. Now, the kind of uh, identity politics almost around party means that it's very, very difficult uh, for any, any party member to vote uh, to remove a member of their own party. It was remarkable uh, that seven Republican senators actually did that. It was the first time in our history that you've had that kind of vote. But even so, it was a foregone conclusion. Sorry for the length of that answer. It's absolutely perfect. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned uh, the law has tried to address that system of polarization and not really taking into account what political parties uh, bring to the table in things like the 12th Amendment and those Senate actions you mentioned. Uh, I wanted to talk about whether the Constitution can be used as a tool to correct that polarization. In a 2016 Judic Justicia article, you wrote that you were skeptical of the law as an instrument of social change. And I wanted to ask, not only if you still believe that, but what role does the law play in advocacy and what role do you think it should play? Okay, this might be an even longer answer, <laughs> so I'm going to apologize for that in advance. So before I come to ways in which one might use the Constitution or other tools to redress the, raw, the harms of polarization... I just want to talk a little bit about how the Constitution uh, exacerbates uh, polarization. So 
Um, you might imagine, uh, you know, take on any issue, the, uh, there might not be enormous polarization among voters as a whole. That is to say, if you took a public opinion poll on some contentious issue, whatever it is, uh, whether it's uh, racial justice, uh, uh, abortion, gun rights, anything, uh, you might find that actually um, positions in the sort of middle get the, the greatest support. And then as you go farther from the middle in each direction, support dies off. So you don't actually have polarization. Uh, nonetheless, you might have polarization in Congress because of our system of government and the constitution contributes to that the way in which it contributes to that the most i think is by assigning to state legislatures the power to create legislative districts for congress and for themselves combined with a decision by the supreme court very recently a case called rucho against common cause that challenges to political gerrymandering by which state legislators uh, ensure that they get back in right, and increase their own political power, challenges to, those, to that action are not, uh, cannot be heard in the federal courts. And so as a result, you have legislat state legislatures creating safe districts. And in a safe district, the key for any member uh, of Congress is to win the primary election. You're more vulnerable in the primary than you are in the general. And therefore, you're going to appeal to primary voters who tend to have more strongly ideological views. So even on issues in which the country is not all that polarized, right, in which public opinion as a whole looks like a bell curve, you might find two peaks uh, by representatives in Congress. Now, that's the House of Representatives. It bleeds over into the presidency because of the Electoral College. You don't, you don't have gerrymandering in the Senate because each, Senate, uh, each state just gets two Senate seats, but you still have this phenomenon whereby uh, the, often the primary election is the key election, and that leads to uh, senators being chosen who are um, to the, the ideological sort of core uh, of their party. I should say, um, and you know, this will sound politically controversial, I think this in recent years has been a bigger problem among Republicans than among Democrats for reasons that are complicated, although it certainly exists for Democrats uh, as well. Okay, so those are some of the ways in which the Constitution exacerbates polarization. How can it be used to counter it? Well, the first and most obvious way is, well, the Constitution gives you freedom of speech, right? So you can use that not only to talk to people in your social information bubbles, your social media bubbles, right, uh, but to break out of that. Uh, I, I was uh, listening to the news just, I think it was yesterday, and I, I heard a uh, social scientist saying that one of the uh, impacts of the pandemic, which may have led to sort of the spread of QAnon conspiracies and other things, uh, is that people are spending much less time interacting with human beings and much more time online. Now, of course, online you're interacting with human beings in the way that you and I are interacting now, but what I mean is you're much more likely to be caught in a social media bubble and less likely to see people who hold different views as merely people who hold different views, but otherwise not so uh, foreign from, from you. Uh, and so that's sort of one way in, in which you can do it. Now, you, you say you referred to a column I wrote in which I said that I was skeptical of the law as an instrument of social change. What I what I I'm not to be clear. I'm a lawyer. I'm a constitutional lawyer. I'm not a nihilist. I think the law often plays an important role. I think the law can even change people's social attitudes, but there has to be something to work with. And so my view about my, what I was saying in that in that piece was where you have very large obstacles to overcome. I right? think about the uh, movement to abolish slavery in the late 18th century. Uh, think about the LGBTQ plus rights movement in the middle of the 20th century, right? When you've got large obstacles, when the, the, the great mass of public opinion is against you, then you're not going to change people's minds or behavior by commanding them to do so because the, those very people are in charge of what becomes the law. And so in those circumstances, you have to work at a kind of one-to-one -one or networking level to change people's attitudes before you can turn to the law 
to try to lock in uh, what progress you've made and to make incremental steps going forward. Absolutely. So we've discussed how politics, how uh, in Rucho v. Common Cause, uh, the Supreme Court hasn't exactly fixed the problem, that the Senate hasn't fixed the problem, and that the LGBTQ movement uh, and others are a better way of maybe addressing this. So I was wondering, in 2016, you wrote that you intended to criticize Trump supporters unflinchingly. In that same article, you also suggested that effective criticism might not be talking down to those ideologically opposed to your beliefs, but rather listening to their concerns. And I was just wondering, how do you walk that line between critique and empathy with people you want to maybe change their minds? Um, So... Again, let's put that in context. I think I wrote that uh, right after the 2016 election when I and many other liberal Democrats were very disappointed in the result. And I was, it, was, it was kind of a self-pep talk. Um, the, uh, so what, l- let, me, let me back up and, and tell a, an anecdote. So I, uh, again, in non-pandemic times, um, I have interactions with people who have all sorts of other views. Now, I live in Ithaca, which is a kind of uh, what sometimes call it a liberal enclave, right? So it's a it's a very blue enclave surrounded by a very red area in an overall blue state. Um, but I encounter people in all sorts of contexts, whether it's, you know, at uh, one of my kids' uh, softball games when I'm playing basketball, and they have diverse opinions about politics. But we usually don't talk about politics, not because we're avoiding it, it just doesn't come up. Um, and so the, uh, I think it's possible to come to see the people who hold views that you find wrong or even repugnant as simply, you know, mistaken. Uh, and if, you know, you encounter somebody with whom you have a relationship and they have a mistaken view, I mean, depending on the nature of the relationship, they'll have a different kind of conversation. But it's, it's very bad persuasion, I think to demonize people, even if their views are, from your perspective, truly demonic, right? It's just not good advocacy. Um, the, the, the one way to think about it is it's the difference between a debate and a conversation, right? If, um, if two people are having a debate, their goal, right? Lincoln wasn't trying to convince Douglas of anything, nor vice versa. They're each trying to persuade the audience that they're right and the other person is wrong, right? But if they were having a conversation, right, or other people are having a conversation, the way you persuade somebody who holds an opposing view is not by sort of scoring points with them, but by listening to them and trying to address their concerns. It, it's not always possible to find common ground, but sometimes you will. But, but I want to be clear. I'm not saying that the, the right answer for everything is to go out and find common ground. Uh, I'm saying it's to, uh, th- that it's at least to try and there might not be common ground, but that's a kind of starting point. Absolutely. I, I'm sure there isn't one perfect script you can follow to convince everyone. Uh, now, I wanted to turn briefly to an event we can't really ignore that many have called the most violent manifestation of polarization in this decade, uh, the January 6th attacks on the U.S. Capitol. Now, congressional Democrats have alleged that President Trump's words incited the violence that we saw there. Uh, what role do you think that our constitutional right to free speech plays in fueling polarization? So um, the, let me say two things. So one is, uh, it's not clear to me that we need to worry about the role it's f- playing in fueling polarization, at least directly, although I think that is a problem. The um, question here is, what role is it uh, playing in fueling violence uh, and a, an attack on democracy? So... With respect to incitement, right, incitement is a technical legal term. Uh, the First Amendment protects freedom of speech. Supreme Court decided in a uh, case called Brandenburg against Ohio that uh, if the worry is that a mob is about to engage in violence, then um, it is permissible to criminally prosecute someone for words uh, but only if, in light of the, all the context and circumstances, the words were intended to and had the effect of inciting violence. Okay, that's the so-called incitement test of Brandenburg. Um, my view is that, the, that various speeches uh, at the rally that preceded the uh, insurrection at the Capitol uh, probably do satisfy the incitement test, but it's 
it's almost a kind of uh, irrelevancy, right? I, I, I think that the, uh, with respect to uh, former President Trump himself, right, that was sort of the culmination of a months-long campaign uh, to undermine democracy. And, you know, that's why I thought that uh, impeachment disqualification would have been an appropriate remedy, regardless of whether the particular words spoken in context in that moment were technically incitements sufficient to support a criminal prosecution. And, and uh, the House managers made more or less that argument during uh, the impeachment trial. So, so um, the... Uh, you know, incitement, I, I think, is is one question. So, so that's incitement of violence. But I want to say one other thing, which is that, you know, the incitement test comes out of um, American experience in the 20th century. In the early 20th century, uh, the Supreme Court rejected just about every free speech challenge to criminal prosecutions. In some of the cases, Justices uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes and Louis Brandeis dissented, uh, and their dissents eventually became the law, right? The Brandenburg test more or less adopts the views of Holmes and Brandeis. Brandeis most famously set these views out in a concurrence in a case that I recommend everybody read called Whitney Against California. It's one of the most beautiful uh, pieces of prose in the U.S. reports, uh, and Brandeis basically gives the following uh, idea, right? You shouldn't respond to words with force if there's still time for words to respond, right? The proper remedy for evil counsels, he says, is wise counsels, right? That, that, that makes sense. Um, but it makes sense in a context in which what you're worried about is what I like to think of as outsider violence. That is to say anarchists or in the early 20th century communists who don't really have any chance of taking over the government but could cause some mayhem right that the incitement test looks to outsiders and says when are the outsiders on the verge of causing a breach of the peace which is you know a serious thing but it's not a worry that they're going to destroy the government the fear that i had and that many people have with respect to january 6th is that it it wasn't just that it was going to lead to the loss of life, which it tragically did, but that it could lead to the loss of our democracy. Right? And and how we view it, I think, is going to be uh, going to, in some ways, uh, uh, determine uh, what happens next. So I'll just give a kind of uh, uh, historical analogy. So um, I don't think we know yet what January 6th was. In the same way that um, we didn't know in 1993 what the first World Trade Center bombing was. We thought it was a failed uh, terrorist act. Uh, it turned out to be a prelude to an extremely successful terrorist act. It could be that January 6th was a failed coup, um, but it could be that it was a prelude to something you know, much, much worse. Yeah, those are some... Big topics to think about. Um, so, we have a question here from the audience. Um, what are your thoughts on how we can enforce honesty in political discussions, especially within and among government agencies and officials? Right. So, part of the problem is you can't enforce honesty. There's a there's a case from the United States Supreme Court uh, about a decade ago called Alvarez against the United States that says that lying. Special, especially political lying, is constitutionally protected freedom of speech. Now, that sounds more outrageous than it actually is. Part of the reason for the holding is the difficulty of having government officials determine what counts as a, the truth and a lie, that that is something that is often up for grabs, even though in the particular case it was very clearly a lie that was at issue. Um, so uh, I don't think that the mechanism for ensuring truth is going to be feasibly some, you know, department of truth, right? It's going to be, again, other tools. You know, um, the social media companies are struggling with this, right? So you saw during the post-election period, before Twitter completely suspended Trump's Twitter account, uh, they would label his tweets, you know, this is contested. Um, 
Uh, I'm not sure whether that works or not. Um, I suspect it might not. I suspect it might be uh, that that might just, you know, get his supporters aroused a little bit. Um, I, I think the only thing that we can really do is uh, encourage people to seek out reliable information. Uh, but again, you've got to have their ear in order to get them to do that. And given the polarization of news sources, right, they're going to have different views about what counts as uh, reliable information. Uh, I, I am not somebody who believes there's no such thing as truth. Uh, I think there are often, you know, multiple sides to stories and so forth. Uh, but, I, but I do think that there is actual reality. Uh, the, you know, the theory of the First Amendment, this is another way in which the Constitution both, uh, you know, is a, t a useful tool, but also can be a problem. I mean, the theory of the First Amendment is that there's no such thing as a false idea. Uh, it doesn't say there's no such thing as a false fact, but it's a kind of, you know, blurry line between uh, ideas and facts. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned there uh, not only social media companies, but the way that's best to get people's ears. Uh, so I wanted to ask, in a 2014 article published in the Harvard Law Review, Marvin Amori asserted that lawyers at private tech companies, such as Google, Twitter, and Facebook, have an enormous impact on free expression globally through the policies they adopt for their millions of users. Social media platforms and the tech companies that run them are arguably some of the most important facilitators of free speech in the modern era. With regards to polarization, however, this presents a paradox. On one hand, the internet is an open platform for speech. On the other, the algorithms that run those platforms feed us increasingly polarized content in the hopes of maintaining our attention. Moving forward, what role can the law play in preserving social media platforms as tools of free speech or reducing their polarizing nature? And how do we as individuals avoid, avoid being drawn into those polarized insular information bubbles? Okay, so um, uh, Tim Wu, my former colleague at Columbia Law School, who's now been named by President Biden uh, in an important advisory capacity, would say you can't. He'd say the business model of Facebook and Twitter, right, and all of these advertiser-driven platforms is simply to get eyeballs and get their attention as long as possible. And what the algorithms do is draw people in, uh, but that ends up feeding them what they want to see, right? So what, what uh, Professor Wu would say is, you got to start from scratch, you got to have a different infrastructure. It could be that you incentivize private companies to do it on a, um, on a, a non-advertiser basis, right? The way you, you pay for certain uh, other kinds of subscription services. It could be that you give a sort of common carrier obligation, it could be the government provides the infrastructure. But that's, but that's sort of the, the most pessimistic view, that is to say that the existing platforms are just not well suited uh, to do this because of the nature of their business model. Uh, I, I find that fairly persuasive, but I think there are probably other less uh, draconian things you can do. I mean, one, one thing that's worth noting is that because these platforms are private, they can take advantage of a kind of loophole uh, in our law, which is that the U.S. Constitution, and thus the First Amendment, does not restrict private actors. And so they have a greater capacity to filter out hate speech, misinformation, and the sorts of things that lead to some of the, the worst problems uh, than the government would. Right? So the fact that it's Facebook or Twitter banning Trump uh, means that there's no First Amendment problem. If you were to shift to a system in which the government runs the platform, you would lose that capacity. Uh, and so there is there is some benefit there. Uh, it's also true, though, that, you know, there is something, you know, dangerous uh, and unaccountable about the people who are doing this uh, for these plat you know, platforms. Uh, I happen to know some of the people who are on Facebook's Supreme Court uh, and they're good people and they're, you know, they're trying their best, but they have no you know real accountability. Yeah, that's a difficult question there. Now. I wanted to move into our final question, our big takeaway for the day. Uh, we've talked about the role of the law and the Constitution in fighting polarization, but given that constitutional change takes time and is something we as lay Americans can't do on our own, what is your number one takeaway to our audience about how we as individuals can counter polarization? Yeah, I mean, again, I would say uh, work uh, locally. Let me, let me give you an analogy. So um, I have lots of interests. I, I do a lot of uh, work with various advocacy groups, um, ACLU, Lambda, uh, and so forth. Um, but my my own, uh, I don't think of myself exactly as an activist, but to the extent that I am an activist, uh, I'm a vegan and I'm a part of the animal rights movement, and I talk to a lot of those people. 
I gave an example before of, you know, I talked about sort of uh, movements in their earliest stages. You know, they're, we're a growing movement, but it's a small movement. Uh, and so if you thought like, you know, we're not going to, you know, abolish animal agriculture or whatever it is the goal of the movement is, right? Tomorrow or even in a decade, what can we do? Well, you can, you know, you can talk to individuals, you can have conversations, you can uh, live by, lead by example. One of the things that I've noticed since I, you know, started doing this about I don't know, 15 years ago or so was how, how much um, you see ideas spread within social circles, right? So that um, the, you know, in the same way that, uh, uh, you know, a virus can spread from person to person, so can ideas. And eventually you develop a critical mass. So, what, so whatever it is that you think you, you want to do, I would say start locally. Uh, the other thing I would say is that if you if you think you you're, if you really care about the political system, uh, the most important uh, place at which you can exert leverage is probably in state legislatures because of all of the power uh, that our constitutional system gives them. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, look, you 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 play the play the cards you're dealt. Uh, I think that the U.S. Constitution was a flawed document when it was written in 1787 and ratified in 1789 because of its uh, acceptance of slavery. It's gotten somewhat better, but it's still, it's a poor fit for our country. Um, but, you know, that's what we've got, what we've got. And there are, there are a lot of opportunities within that system to, to, you know, make real progress on whatever issue is important to you. That's inspiring. Absolutely. We should all be working to spread those ideas and hopefully make the world a better place, regardless of how, uh, hard it may seem to do. Now, so thank you again, Professor Dorff, for joining us today on Speak Now. And thank you to the audience for participating in this thought-provoking discussion with us. Today's episode is brought to you by The Advocacy Project and co-sponsored by the Cornell Law School. A special thanks go out to E. Cornell and our logistical team for all their help and support. And if you would join us on March 19th for our next episode, Crossing Borders, where my wonderful colleague, Callie McQuilkin, will discuss the polarization of immigration with Professor Stephen Yale Lohr. Until next time, and thank you so much for coming. Thank you.